The North Pole used to be a no man's land, but uh, these are the days when, by buying a ticket on a commercial airliner, you can fly across the North Pole and drink a cocktail at the same time. You know, only three score or more years ago, about 35 years ago, our guest tonight found out whether there was any land north of the North American continent. He made that first discovery flight, and I must say that Admiral Byrd, our guest tonight, is not only our greatest living explorer, but he's been an inspiration to countless Americans. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any unexplored land left on this earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole, because it's getting crowded up there now, because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from Middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that, unexplored. That's a tremendous So challenge. there's a lot of adventure left mm. down at the bottom of the world. Well, Admiral, well, do you hope to see that? I do. <laughs> well, Admiral, yeah. would you say that uh, since you've been to both the extremities of Earth, are these expeditions to such far off places, are they getting easier because of modern techniques, or is, still, is danger still close at hand? Well, it's a little risky, but nothing like it used to be with the old slow planes and the small cruising radius where we had to put down bases. We replaced the dog teams, and of course that was a big improvement. But now the planes go much faster, and they are safer, and they have a much bigger cruising radius. You haven't got the danger of a terribly heavy load. Mm -hmm. Admiral, a, an expedition to which I believe you're the advisor is now en route. Uh, what is that expedition doing? Well, that's the icebreaker ATCA, and it's a reconnaissance expedition. It's going down to the South Pole area to make certain observations and to, to look for some bases. They will be back in April, and they will report back, and upon the information we get from that undertaking, uh, we will base the bigger expedition that's to follow. Uh, is that very definitely planned, or uh, is that... Uh, that is being planned right now. So I'm willing to say to you that uh, there will be a number of expeditions that will follow, I think, uh, year after year, the bottom of the world, because the government has really become interested. Well, Admiral Byrd, I can understand, I think everybody can, the interest in the North Pole, because it's so near our greatest challenger, Soviet Russia. But why this interest in the uh, bottom of the world? Nobody living down there, is there? No, it's, um, it's pretty cold. There's only one permanent resident, that's the Emperor Penguin. The little ones live further north. I tell you one reason they're interested. It's by far the most uh, valuable, important place left in the world for science. That's why the scientific groups all over the nation are really interested. But more important than that, it's, uh, it has to do with the future uh, of the nation, those to come after us, or even uh, during your lifetime. Because it happens to be an untouched reservoir of natural resources. And, uh, you know, as the world shrinks with an ever-increasing acceleration, far-flung places, once useless, like we thought the North Pole was, and no man's land, become very useful. Uh, the bottom of the world will be important, not only to us, but to our allies. Uh, does it, I was going to ask you, does it have military importance? Uh, it has some, and uh, as the world shrinks, it will continue to shrink with an ever-increasing acceleration, thus bringing these places closer. And in the future, I can see a time when it will be very, very important strategically. Well, has the development and, and of air power increased their, the strategic importance of places like the uh, oh, very much Palmer so. Peninsula, we'll say? Uh, very much so. Even now, if uh, anything happened and we uh, lost the Panama Canal, we would have to control the islands just north of Antarctica, which are part of Antarctica. I've then between there and Cape Horn. I've heard it said that uh, there are seven continents in the world, and one of them has never been seen by a woman, and that's Antarctica. Is that actually true? Well, if the power of an island 
As far as I know, that's true. No woman's ever stepped foot upon the Antarctic continent, and it's the most peaceful place in the world. Well, I'm sure that won't <laughs> last very long. Uh, <clears throat> today, I understand that now that you're working with the, uh, the Arnold Bread Company in charge of frozen foods now, is there any future for frozen foods down these frozen extremities? Well, I think the uh, human race can be helped uh, by that. Uh, this was thought out by Dean Arnold, who's, uh, in my opinion, the great humanitarian. He uh, learned that we went down there after four or five years and finished a meal that we had left there on the table when we had evacuated Little America. Everything was perfect, including the bread. So he got the idea of this frozen bread and already he sent some to he sent some to Europe and just very worked very well over there for the, some of the starving people. Yes, sir. So you can store it down in the Antarctic and against the lean years and you wouldn't have any people in the world really starving if you did that. Yes, in the event of an atomic war, you stay there forever. Admiral, you speak of the resources of Antarctica. What are they? What uh, what are the natural resources there? Well, a. Uh, We've found enough of coal within 180 miles of the South Pole in a great uh, ridge of mountains. It's not covered with snow. Enough to supply the whole world for quite a while. Well, uh, that's, that's the coal. Now, there's evidence of uh, other, many other minerals. Uh, we are pretty sure there's oil. Now, that coal shows the bottom of the world. Now, by far, the coldest spot in the world, where that coal is, gets 100 below zero in the winter. Well, uh, it was once tropical. So uh, we think there's oil there, and there's evidence, probably uranium there. Is it any secret? Is there uranium there? That would be the only thing that would be practical to uh, actually go after, I suppose. Everything else would be economically uh, unfeasible, wouldn't it? Well, as we recklessly expend our resources, the time will come, and we can, we'll have to go after that stuff down there. Well, you know, I, I avoided what you said about uranium. I'm not sure about that. I don't want to have the world fight over the Antarctic. And Robert, is there a competition among other nations to try to get information about uh, Antarctica and uh, possibly to secure some of these resources? Well, uh, yes. Uh, there are now seven nations very much interested. Russia is interested tremendously. That I'm sure of. Australia has an expedition down there. The Argentine, the Chile, New Zealand, Britain, and so on. Now, you can understand those people down there being uh, interested because they live down there, the New Zealanders, the Argentinians, the Chileans, and the Australians. And so uh, we, uh, we don't do much about claiming anything. Admiral, you uh, make Joey this sound a little crowded. Uh, uh, are, are, are there that many expeditions now there or en route there? Uh, well, you know, as I said, it's the most peaceful place in the world, but I don't think it will be for long because of this intense interest on the part of, uh, of other nations and this nation. Well, Admiral Berg, are uh, private expeditions a thing of the past? Is, it, is expedition and exploration, making expedition and exploration now a purely a government function because uh, of the tremendous no, cost organization? No, I don't think so. I think down south, it may be more or less a thing of the past, but not other other expeditions that go. There's a lot of them going off now. This latest expedition now on the way is a government expedition, I take it. Yes, that's the government. Robert, may I ask you, is there a great difference between the uh, top of the world and the bottom of the world? Uh, the there is. Now, uh, the North Pole is the center of an ocean 10,000 feet deep. The South Pole, the center of a plateau, 10,000 feet high. The North Polar Sea is surrounded by um, continents that are slightly frozen. The Antarctic continent is surrounded by uh, a belt of ice, frozen seas of at least 1,200 miles thick. Now, the south is a plateau. It gets, in some places, 14,000 feet up. Uh, I've been over areas about 13,000, and it's a little bit chilly up there. So there's, uh, there's that big difference between the top and bottom of the world. I don't, con the north really isn't very cold up there on the Arctic Ocean. Not compared to the south. Admiral Byrd, we often hear it said that our young Americans now aren't as hardy as their forefathers. Do you think that Americans do measure up to the standards, uh, the physical standards and morale standards of the past? I do. 
I don't believe that. I think they're just as hardy. Well, what would you say was the most uh, valuable factor on expedition? Is it uh, morale or uh, physical courage or is it uh, sheer equipment? Well, I've always thought that loyalty was by far the most important trait. The British told me that when I first went down 28, that I couldn't possibly get through the winter night without a mutiny if I took more than 20 men. But to serve science, I had to take 42 men. And then I took 56 the next time, and so on. So, and I did find that loyalty was the most important thing during the winter night when it's very hard on your nerves. Is, uh, I think that's best that's trait. Well, that's a very valuable characteristic at any time. Well, thank you very much, Admiral Byrd. It's been a um, great pleasure to have you here tonight. It's a pleasure to be with you. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and Kenneth Crawford. Our distinguished guest was Admiral Richard E. Byrd. A Longines watch makes the most perfect Christmas gift. It has beauty, elegance, and enduring quality, and a universal reputation as just about the finest of the world's watches. Now, actually, barring accident or abuse, the Longines watch that you give this Christmas will be better than new after five or even ten years of daily use. Time holds no terrors for a Longines. The exquisitely finished watch movement defies normal wear and friction, achieves unsurpassed timekeeping accuracy and reliability. Thus does Longines inner quality match Longines outer elegance. Among the finest watches of the world, only Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Cased in precious metals, styled in the best of good taste, a Longines watch is a joy to own, an enduring symbol of your affection, the perfect Christmas gift. Yet, you may buy and proudly give a Longines watch this Christmas for as little as $71.50. Visit your Longines Whitnor Jeweler Agency and make your selection. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored Christmas gift. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches.